Hey guys, how you doing? This is Mr. Lee. Um, in this video, I just want to go through very quickly. This is the quick version of your lecture for 5.1. If you're looking for more detail and a longer, more thorough version, I uploaded that as the long version. But here we go. So the big idea of surveying and sampling, uh, specifically of sampling, is that you want to know something about an entire population. So you've identified a population of interest. So for example, um, who is in this population of interest, you might want to know something about all high school seniors in the Tri-Valley area. Then instead of going to every single high school senior in the Tri-Valley area, instead of trying to contact every single person, every single individual in the population, you're going to choose a representative sample okay, of size little n. Okay? And then this sample, um, you will then actually contact the sample or do something with the sample and um, you will gather some actual data, some actual observations from the sample and then you will summarize that and analyze that using st statistical modeling and then you will make an inference about the entire population. Okay. So here's a couple of key terms that you really need to memorize uh, from section one. And the first one is the definition of randomness as it relates to sampling. Like what is what does random actually mean um, when we're sampling? It means that every individual in the population has the exact same probability of being selected. So one over N. And then every sample size of, or every sample of size N so now it's not just every individual, but every group, okay, um, within the entire population, every sample of size N has the same probability of every other sample of size N, okay? So they all have the exact same probability of being selected. And really the only two ways to ensure randomness is table B and um, to think about like what really meets the definition of random, it's using the table of random digits, which is table B in our book, or think of the example of like putting names in a hat, shaking it up, you know, and then you know, maybe being blindfolded or not looking in the hat and picking out one of those names. That does meet the definition of randomness because every single one of those names in the hat has the same probability of being selected. Now, of course, you would have had to have you know, thought about things like, well, the names are written on the same size index card and the index card is only folded once in the exact same way and you know, um, just all these di different things. But they have to have you know, the same probability of being selected. The other term that you really need to know the, the definition of is bias. And that's both of these terms, random and bias, are words that are used colloquially, but not, you know, used correctly. So bias is something in the design of the study that systematically leads to a particular outcome. It systematically leads to a particular outcome because of the way the design, uh, the study was designed. Okay. So it could be something in the design of the study itself. It could be in the wording um, of how the questions were asked. It could be if it's an experiment, it could be, you know, um, something within the experiment, or it could even be in the sampling stage when you're putting together your sample. Like if you put your sample together incorrectly, then um, that could lead to bias. So there's three types of samples um, that we're going to talk about. Um, there's the simple random sample, which is the SRS. Then there's the stratified random sample, not SRS, even though it is SRS. Okay. SRS only means simple random sample. Okay. So stratified random sample, we always call it stratified random sample. Then finally, cluster sample. So the first one of those was the SRS. And the SRS is basically to, to use the SRS or to create a simple random sample. Basically, we need to know like all the names of the individuals in the population. So in my little hypothetical example, if we wanted to know something about all high school seniors in the Tri-Valley area, we would just get a roster of all of those names. And let's just pretend there's 5,000 of those names. And we could just put them in alphabetical order but then we're going to label them. Okay. We're going to label them and we're going to label them with the same number of digits. So for example, since there's 5,000, my population size capital N equals 5,000. My first person, I'm going to label them with 0001. 
then 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 0, 3, and then all the way, so, so, and so on and so forth until I get to 5,000. So I want to ensure that all of the individuals have the same number of digits in their label. Okay, And then I just simply use table B, the table of random digits, or I use my calculator. Okay, Although my calculator, even though it says it's a random number generator, it's not technically random. It's following a, a man-made computer program. It's following an algorithm. And um, we can show that in class, but the calculator is not truly random. It is pseudo-random. Okay, it emulates something that is random. Um, but the textbook, table B, truly is random. Okay. Um, and then when we, if we do end up using table B, we also have to, on our exam or quiz or homework or whatever, we have to describe the steps that we took to use table B. So here are the steps to take. So first label all individuals the same number of digits. So let's just pretend, in this case, let's pretend that there was just three digits. So 001, 002, all the way up to whatever the last number is, okay? So you label them all, and that doesn't matter what order you label them in, you can just label them alphabetically as fine, okay? Then you start on a particular line number. That also doesn't matter what line number you choose. You just have to state, okay, I started in, I started on line number 106 or whatever line number it is. On the AP exam, they'll give you an excerpt from the table or they will tell you which line number to start on so that obviously they can then grade it and everyone gets the same answers. Then you want to write down as your description, read that table from left to right until you have selected the N individuals, however many individuals you're trying to select. Okay, And then you also have to write down in your instructions, skip repeats. That's very important because there are processes where you do not skip repeats, but in an SRS, you do skip repeats when you're using table B. All right, next is a stratified random sample. And the idea of a stratified random sample is very simple, but knowing when to use it is the important thing. You're going to use a stratified random sample when you have strata in your population. What I mean by strata is that there are subgroups in the population, subsets of the population that share some homogeneous characteristics. And you want to make sure that you include each one of those subgroups, each one of those strata in your sample, because you want your sample to be representative of the entire population. So one very um, typical strata that you know, studies often include are gender. So if I want to know something about, you know, the entire population of high school, high school seniors in the Tri-Valley area, um, if, my, if the thing, if the, my question of interest, my response, if my outcome variable, if the thing that I'm really trying to study about them, if it's influenced by something like gender, then I have strata. I have important strata. I'm going to stratify my sample, right? So for example, let's say I want to know, well, what is the, you know, what is the height of, um, a high school senior in the Tri-Valley area? What's the, you know, what is the height that represents all high school seniors? Well, I might want to stratify by gender. I might want to stratify, okay, here's the males, here's the females, here's the um, trans students, here are, um, you know, non-binary students. I might want to have all the different strata. And then what I do is I simply take an SRS from each one of those different strata that I want to make sure that I incorporate in my sample. Okay. All right. Um, and then the last type of sampling that we use is um, cluster sampling. And with cluster sampling, it's a lot of students get confused between clusters and strata. And they kind of think, oh, they're kind of the same thing. No, they're not. So what I want you to think of is think that they're the opposite. Okay. They're not actually opposites, but just I want you to think of them as opposites so that you can clearly distinguish, well, what is strata and what is a cluster? So with strata, you had little subsets within the population that had homogeneous characteristics to each other, but not homogeneous with the other subgroups, right? So you wanted to make sure that you got like, you know, many, you got, you got a representative sample. So with a cluster sample, you do have subsets within the population, but each one of these subsets is like a microcosm of the entire population. So each one of these clusters or these subsets has all the variation of the entire population. Okay, so a cluster in my little like 
you know, hypothetical example might be one of the one of the large public high schools in the Tri Valley area. Okay, that that might be considered a cluster, like Dublin High. Like Dublin High has you know a lot of the variation or all of the variation you know that the entire Tri Valley area would have. Okay, so it's kind of representative. So it's kind of the opposite. Um, instead of like strata, where strata are homogeneous subgroups. Okay, um, with clusters, each cluster is a heterogeneous subset of the population, meaning it has all the heterogeneity, it has all the variety, all the variation within it that represents the entire population. So how do you cluster sample? You simply divide the population into the clusters, um, and then you randomly select which cluster you want to use or which clusters you want to use in the sample. And then you use all the individuals from within that cluster. So in my hypothetical example of, let's say my population of interest was all high school seniors in the Tri-Valley area, the clusters I might consider are the large public high schools um, in the Tri-Valley area. So Amador Valley, um, Livermore, Granada, Foothill, Dublin High, um, San Juan Valley, Monta Vista, Cal High, Doherty Valley. You know, those might be the high schools and I might think of them as clusters. Okay. And then I can randomly select one or more of those high schools and then I would simply use all the high school seniors at that in that particular cluster. So here's an example that kind of summarizes all of that. Okay, so let's say you have um, a performance or something going on at a high school, you have a, or a school assembly, I guess. And here's the stage, and then here are the rows. So the front row, they're numbered one through ten, and then eleven through twenty. So there's kind of this middle aisle. So there's basically there's 20 seats in the first row, 20 seats in the next row. And, you know, these gaps are, you know, there'd be all these other rows and there's 800 seats total. Okay. And we also know that the ninth graders sit all the way in the back, 601 to 800. 10th graders get 400 to 600. 11th grader gets, 11th graders get seats 201 to 400. And the seniors, the mighty seniors, they get to sit in the very front, best seats in the house, right? They've earned it. So um, how would we take a, an SRS of size n equals 80? We want to get 80 students. And notice that 80 is 1 tenth of 800. That's a good fun fact just to kind of plant in your brain. It's about 10%. But if little n equals 80, how do I do an SRS? Well, I simply number all of these chairs with the same number of, and this is, I can either use table D or table B, sorry. I can either use a table of random digits or I can use the calculator. But again, let's just use table B, okay? So I would have to renumber this not as one, but as 001, 002, 003, all the way to 800. Because all of these have to have the same number of digits, so three digits, right? Then I just simply write out, well, now I'm going to go to table B in the back of the book. I'm going to start from line, you choose whatever line, it doesn't matter. Um, choose starting at line 106, you know, read the table from left to right, okay, and select 80 students between the number 001 and 800, okay, and skip repeats. All right, well, how would a stratified random sample work? Well, are there homogeneous subgroups? Well, yeah, there are, right? Grade level. So what, out of 80, let's say I want to choose 29th graders, 2010th graders, 2011th graders, and 2012th graders. Well, how would I do that? Well, they're already broken up into the different strata, just numbers 001 to 200, okay? Then numbers 201 to 400, 401 to 600, and 601 to 800. So I just take a, a an SRS of size n equals 20 from each one of these different strata. Okay, then I'd get a, sorry, that's my dog. Are you okay? You okay? Are you okay? Sorry, my dog's having a bad dream. Hang on. Okay. Um, how about cluster sampling? Well, how would you do a cluster sample? Well, with cluster samples, you want to get the, you want to have um, not homogeneous subgroups, you want to have heterogeneous subgroups that represent the entire population. So how can I get a cluster that has ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders? Well, those would be these columns, not the rows, but the columns, right? So if I take column uh, from 
you know, this column here. So this would be column one, column two, column three. There's 20 columns of these seats, right? I could randomly select um, you know, just however many columns I need to get a sample of size n equals 80. Okay, and then that column, let's say that I chose column number one. Well, that's going to have ninth graders, 10th graders, 11th graders, and 12th graders because it includes seats number one and all these other seats, 21, um, 41, 61, et cetera, et cetera, all the way up to 781, okay? All right, now these are some of the things you need to, these are some, this is some of the terminology that you need to watch out for because these are some of the biases and some of the things that can go wrong when you're designing your sample, okay? So voluntary response sample. That is where the respondents are self-selecting, okay? And that is no good because that typically leads to bias because usually people who feel strongly negative about whatever topic it is are the ones who are going to self-select and everyone else is just going to pass. Convenience sampling, that leads to bias as well. That would be like, oh, well, I live in Dublin, so I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to contact my friends who are in Dublin. You know, if I want to know something about all high school seniors in the, you know, in the state of California or all high school seniors in the country in the United States. But I live in Dublin and my sample is just like conveniently created. Like I just, I just contact like whoever lives near me. Well, that's going to be, there's going to be some, that's going to be prone to bias. Sampling error. Um, there's always going to be, there always can be sampling error. Um, and that comes from the act of choosing what type of sample. Um, there's random sampling error and under coverage. Um, so under coverage is where um, the design of the sample, it, it leaves out, it leaves out certain people or groups or certain, certain individuals, okay? And so it undercovers the population. Um, so non-sampling errors are very serious. So non-sampling errors are um, non-response. That's where um, your respondents just fail. They just choose not to respond. There's response bias. Um, and there's wording of questions, wording of questions. So response bias is if something in the design of the study um, creates a response bias, creates, you know, makes them, makes people respond in a particular way. Okay, so um, yeah, and then wording of the questions, like how the questions are worded, and there's examples in the textbook, but um, how the questions are worded can also lead to bias, can also have bias because they can lead to a particular answer, okay? And guys, that's all we have. That's all I have for you. Hope you enjoyed the video. See you in the next lecture.